This is the Open University. Hello, it's a stormy day here in Paris and not really worth going out into. So I'm going to stay at home and watch my pot plants, make sure they don't uh, get bowled over. And um, it's a good opportunity to take you back in a little sort of time travel exercise to the New York of 25 years ago. It's uh, between 2000 and 2002 I was living in New York City. And I did this, um, I was living in London before that. Um, I'd been in Paris in the mid-90s, moved back to London for the cool Britannia years, as we now refer to them. Then I got bored. When I turned 40, I thought I need to really sort of shake up my life and my career and all the rest of it. So, hey, New York City, it's the place for ambition. It's the uh, place where if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere, etc., etc. So, um, and also I had a visa. I mean, I had a touring visa and they would give you like a whole year just for a two-week uh, rock tour or whatever. You, so I had no reason not to be there and... Uh, um, I got invited initially just to do a cabaret at a place called uh, Net Active. The Knitting Factory, which was one of the main venues in downtown New York, had a little... They wanted to do an internet cabaret. Um, so I did this thing called Electronics in the 18th Century with Torquil Campbell, who uh, sings in a band called Stars. He was a very good um, straight man to work with because what I would do would be um, improvise these kind of gags about... Um, uh, imagine an 18th century in which you had all the sort of pimps and dandies and and people from say London in in the 18 in the 1760s or, or whatever but you also had electronics so it was a kind of weird retro thing we, we showed um, excerpts from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang I think it was on a little screen and talk would um, pretend to be called Vidal or something and you know uh, I would sing a song usually from my Folktronic album. And uh, so this happened once a week, and I thought it was going to get big, like uh, Kiki and Herb, uh, they, they did the sort of gay cabaret, with it, which actually involved a couple of my songs. They sang How to Get and Stay Famous, for instance. Really fantastic. It was Justin Bond who, who played this character called Kiki, who was like a clapped-out old um, uh, kind of Sunset Boulevard um, former star. Um, and they'd transferred and, and were managing to make a lot of money and make names for themselves. I'd already been coming to New York since 1996 to do like in stores and other music and uh, um, concerts, obviously, and CMJ performances and things like that. But um, moving there was, was different. And I, I initially lived just north of uh, Central Park with a Vietnamese woman. I don't know really how that happened. It was just someone who... I'd been emailing with or something and she was um it was quite a scary area I was a bit scared to go out our back windows overlooked these really derelict buildings which were occupied by crackheads and homeless people and uh, she would go to the, to buy the groceries in in Harlem I was too scared because she was Asian and Asian people kind of just pass you know for black I guess in black areas but I would have really stood out I think things have changed quite a bit in Harlem since then but I really felt, and, and, and to some extent people amplified back to me that that was a dangerous place. I then moved to a, a sort of share house in Brooklyn for a while, Carroll Gardens. And um, then I, uh, I kind of, I thought I didn't move all this way to, to America just to live in Brooklyn. <laughs> Sorry, Brooklyn. I wanted to live in Manhattan and be like Andy Warhol or something. So. I got this apartment. Uh, I had, I befriended an art student called Rika, a Japanese art student. And really my time in New York is dominated by Asian people and Asian districts because she helped me find this um, apartment on Orchard Street. So I lived at 38 Orchard Street, which is, it's really Chinatown, although it's sort of, it's just on the fringes. It's obviously a, a previously Jewish area. You've got the uh, Tenement Museum just a few blocks up on uh, Ludlow Street. Um, so it still had a few Jewish delis and things dotted around, a bagel bakery called Kossars nearby with excellent bagels. But mostly it was my street, my block was Chinese. It was the, the um, intersection of Hester Street and uh, Orchard Street and just parallel to Allen Street. So I'd often go into Chinatown, buy oranges and dumplings and that would be my lunch would be... Uh, five dumplings for one dollar from Vanessa Wing's uh, place on Eldridge Street and then I'd buy like a few oranges and eat those and uh, cheap and cheerful. Um, I think Vanessa's 
dumpling place is still there. This is one of the things that this can be about, what's still there and what's gone. Because a lot of people tell me that New York got way too expensive and all the interesting stuff went. My first experiences with New York really centered around record stores or magazine stores, which were attached to record stores. So you had all these, you had Virgin, you had Tower, you had, uh, did you have HMV? I'm not sure. You had uh, other music and uh, various other indie store, record stores there. A lot of bookstores as well, you know, culture stores were a thing in the 90s in a way that they hadn't been since then, really. So they all disappeared one by one. And I think the last one to go was the Virgin Megastore in 2014, if I'm right. Uh, there, were, there were several Virgin Megastores. There was one at uh, Times Square. There was one at Union Square. That was the one I knew better. But uh, they weren't very interesting. And the, the really interesting places were, you know, Kim's um, video and music store, uh, which was dubious. They used to do pirate. <laughs> they were pirating in-store CDs and DVDs and selling them as kind of, you know, legit um, things. But th they were a um, fantastic uh, repository of, you know, Max Tundra records and electronic records from Rechenzentrum and all these, these people I was getting into in about 2000 were often German or European experimental electronic artists. Other music, of course, important for that too. Other music had a, a lounge core easy listening kind of section, which I was in, which uh, was really the crossover of Japanese artists from Shibuya K with uh, retro lounge kind of artists like the Bomolo label in Berlin, which I was also working with. So it was my moment in the sunshine in terms of the American market. I'd been concentrating up until that point uh, really on Britain and Japan. But I, I sort of decided because the, the college circuit in the US was sort of open to me then, I, I thought, um, and I was getting coverage in all the local rags, the free papers that were uh, the thing at the time. You had the Village Voice, you had the New York Observer, I think it was called, the various free papers which were the, the remnants of the underground publishing of the 60s, the counterculture of the 60s. What else was happening in New York at that time? Fisher Spooner was pretty big. Um, so-called electroclash movement, but there was also something I concentrated much more on, this kind of neo-folk, electronica, eccentric bands like Centimeters and the Melted Men. And the Melted Men weren't from New York, but and um, the art world was basically hosting. I mean, Deitch and uh, um, Casey Spooner were very close, and Casey Spooner also got in with... Um, the Berlin curator, who then became a MoMA curator, who is Klaus Biesenbach, who had founded Kunstwerk in Berlin. So Casey Spooner is sort of working the gay angle and um, the fashion angle and the art angle, working all the angles, really. A very narcissistic kind of troupe of dancers who who'd rehearse in front of mirrors with, um, uh, you know, fashion photographers shooting pictures of them and um, really into themselves, but also, you know, quite exciting, especially when they did their Wire cover, the 25th, this song by Wire, uh, during which Casey would do a really lightning fast costume change like a kabuki actor or like David Bowie in the Ziggy period. He'd get this first costume ripped off in front of a fan, which was streaming his hair back, you know, in some little gallery, you know, in, in Chelsea, this was, um, the art scene was moving at this time between Soho, which had been its home, up to Chelsea. The sort of old garages and car shops of Chelsea were all being transformed into um, art galleries. And that's where I had my uh, first art shows as well. I was invited by Zach Foyer from, first of all, LFL Gallery and then Foyer Gallery to do shows. I did three, a total of three shows with Zach. So um, even after I'd left New York in 2002, I was still coming back regularly for art shows uh, to, to Manhattan. So I, I did witness some of the changes after 2002, but I was no longer interested in living there. I'd sort of lived my New York dream. That was it. Uh, I, I much preferred Tokyo and Japan so, and Berlin. So I, I gravitated to those places much more. But... Um, yeah, 9-11 uh, happened and um, I'd just come back from Tokyo. So already I was spending at least half the year in 2001 in Tokyo with uh, my Japanese girlfriend at the time. And uh, she was also, like we would kind of commute between Tokyo and New York. She would come for three months on her visa to uh, the US and I would go to Japan on a tourist visa for a couple of months at a time or three months at a time. 
And we had these two apartments, one in Nakameguro and one in the Lower East Side. So, but 9-11 scared me and not so much the actual attacks, which happened on a beautiful sunny day and were just bizarre. It was like some kind of almost a carnivalesque atmosphere. The streets emptied of traffic, so it was very peaceful in an ironic way. Um, but it was the peace before the storm. And then what really scared me was the U.S., reprisals that were going to happen when they hit everything and just randomly started attacking all over the world. So, um, and ironically, not the countries that the terrorists were actually from. They just attacked whoever they felt like attacking, Afghanistan, Iraq, whatever. Um, but yeah, it was that sort of jingoism and the US flags that suddenly appeared everywhere. And this was when America took its lurch to the right, essentially. I mean, it started arguably with Gore losing the... Um, uh, election to Bush in 2000. Uh, that was a very disappointing moment and I do remember being in my flat on Orchard Street just being absolutely aghast at the fact that Gore had not won. Um, it was also the time of the dot-com uh, bust so there'd been this kind of uh, hyperactive uh, energy invested into the internet and the future of business on the internet which you know was correct it wasn't a rational exuberance to invest in the internet but people had been investing too much in too many silly companies that didn't come to anything so that all did um, collapse just when i was first in new york the first year in new york um so there was this kind of weird transitional moment and i i do think that what i experienced was the 90s new york so um having been there with my friends jill and uh, matt jacobson who was sort of managing my american career at the time with his label, The Grand Magistry, um, we would hang out, even before I lived in the Lower East Side, we'd go to the Lower East Side and drink chai, which is a new drink to me, this sort of American, very sweetened tea, syrupy kind of chai tea. Uh, I didn't like coffee at the time, I didn't drink coffee, it made me too excited. But uh, we'd go to places like the Lotus Cafe on Clinton Street, which of course gets mentioned in a Leonard Cohen song, The Street Does, the cafe wouldn't have been there then. Um, and there was just something about the Lower East Side. It was also changing very rapidly. It had been a dangerous place where people would rob you and murder you, but it was becoming, um, well, it was Hispanic in the northern parts as you got up towards the East Village, but then the southern parts, it was very Chinese and still little dribs and drabs of the Jewish presence, uh, which had preceded the Chinese presence. Actually, before the Jewish people moved in, there were Germans there. So the people who actually built those terraced, uh, very European uh, buildings were Europeans and Albert Camus if you read his diary of New York um, that was the only part the downtown that I lived in was the only part of New York that he recognized as having any genuine street life in New York we could live in this bubble there were places I would go to Let, let's see if I can list a few of the places I would well first of all it was internet cafes on Lafayette Street actually right next door to where David Bowie bought his penthouse with uh, Iman and um, or places like Un Universal News on Broadway, which had all the fashion magazines and everything. And you could sit there drinking a drink of some kind and reading magazines for free in the Japanese style. You don't have to buy to read. Um, or it would be, you know, other music, obviously. Um, bars like uh, Double Happiness, which was in a very dark little basement on Mott Street. Um, or I had a friend called Eric Swenson who lived in the East Village. Um, so... Uh, a little bit, or, or um, Stephen Merritt from the Magnetic Fields, with whom I collaborated and did interviews and things and was kind of friendly. So uh, we toured together, you know. What other places were, there were all these night spots like Void, there was a place called Void, or a, a day spots like uh, there was a cafe I really liked on Mercer Street, I think it was, in Soho called um, Untitled Space. Kind of pretentious, but huge huge space which now I don't think you could get in Soho a kind of space that large and just sell coffee you know and justify it I think it would have had have to have been at a time when Soho was still a bit neglected a bit sort of down market um, obviously it'd been a continuous evolution from when Philip Glass and people like that moved in and got lofts very cheap there the Iron District Iron Wrought Iron District as it's known uh, that was saved from um, being flattened by Robert Moses, the highway proponent, um, by people like Jane Jacob. Jane Jacob's doing um, civic uh, uh, protest against the redevelopment of these beautiful historic areas of New York. But um, 
My first friend actually in New York was called Regina Joseph and she was uh, living in Greenwich Village. So I, my first few trips there, I'd stay with Regina and her husband, Martin, happened to be called Martin Curry, uh, no relation. And they were working in an advertising agency in Tribeca. So my first kind of experiences were really Greenwich Village, which I continue to associate with people like Bob Dylan and, you know, the folk scene of the 60s. So it felt a bit old fashioned to me, but also very gay um, now, gay kind of center. Uh, Tribeca is sort of becoming trendy, um, but it was the wrong end of Chinatown. I was at the, at the wrong end of Canal Street, essentially. I was at the other end of Canal Street. Um, Canal Street was just at the bottom of my, of my block. There were some art galleries moving in. It's now a kind of art area where I used to live. A lot of little galleries around there. But there was the first one I remember was a place called Kunst on, I think, East Broadway or Division Street. East Broadway, uh, which was an old Jewish music hall, which they'd converted. It had become an electrical store. And then Kunst uh, took over and became a gallery in the... They didn't even change the frontage. It still looked like an electrical store, um, but electrical goods, but... Uh, became a gallery. And then on Ludlow Street, just the next block from me, um, Dexter Sinister had a little kind of concealed basement under a storm door, uh, which was for um, Stuart Bailey uh, and um, his colleagues' uh, kind of graphic design experiments and things. There were a lot of things. Of, of another place, uh, Tonic, super important Tonic on Ludlow Street, um, little music venue where I'd play with people like uh, Arto Lindsay, and uh, I met Stuart Murdoch once in there. And, you know, they're just a, a, a real neighborhood hangout. There were always these kind of lineups involving um, ex members of the No New York bands that, you know, had uh, compiled decades before, 20 years before. Um, Ikoe Mori and play, people like that playing in various lineups and combinations. And also the. Um, John Zorn kind of gang was always playing there. And uh, further up Ludlow Street, there was a place called Pink Pony, which was the first cafe I really latched onto. I used to just sit in Pink Pony uh, next to Max Fish, which was the famous bar. Uh, I used to be friendly with Harmony Kareen, so I remember going with Harmony and some of his friends, a little guy called Brian with spiky hair who'd sort of score heroin for Harmony. Uh, to Max Fish, for instance. I even looked at an apartment above Max Fish, but it would have been horrifically noisy. If we did go across into Brooklyn, we went to Williamsburg, and Bedford Avenue was a kind of with the main drag, a bit like a college town, really, in that kind of self-consciously hip way. There was a little kind of shopping mall, which was all just very trendy, you know, uh, shops, uh, fronted by Spoonbill and uh, Sugar Town, which was a, uh, a bookshop with arty books. I once saw uh, Vito Conchi, uh, giving a lecture there and um, that was where some of my friends lived um, Rika Hirata who later took her own life alas um, was living there uh, or her boyfriend Ryan was living there so um, that was a that was always a fun place to go to and galleries like Pierogi were there as well which you would um, you would check out the, the new shows and things um, that's one memory I have is just the, the in Chelsea, the openings when they're all synchronized, there would be certain evenings, say a Friday evening or a Saturday uh, in Chelsea, when just the huge art crowds would uh, arrive, mostly really young people and a lot of them based in Brooklyn, you know, Bushwick and, and stuff. They would come in on the L train and they'd be there for these uh, uh, art openings. And you, there would just be a real vivacity, a real effervescence on the streets of Chelsea protected from traffic, really, although they'd all been car shops once upon a time. Um, there were also some high-class stores. I had a good friend called Hiroshi Sonari, who now teaches at NYU Art School, um, who worked in Comme des Garçons at the time. And if we wanted to go and see him, we'd uh, cross the road from... Comme des Garçons had this amazing architect design kind of uh, metallic door, which led you in, almost like a vagina or something, and led you into the store uh, through a, a metallic tunnel curved, organic-looking metallic tunnel. Opposite Comme des Garçons was a place called the Wild Lily Tea Room, which was a beautiful Japanese cafe with sort of fish ponds in the, in the cafe, which you could sit around, gather around. And uh, I went there a lot with Kihimi Kari or whoever was in, in town at the time. So many haunts and places. Um, 
the uh, St. Mark's uh, uh, kind of area, there was Sunrise Mark where Rika actually worked and um, <clears throat> there was Decibel, which was a Japanese sake cafe um, in a basement nearby there. There was the St. Mark's bookstore, which was the place to go for all the most interesting new publications, magazines and books and things like that. Um, all gone now, uh, as far as I know, Decibel. Sunrise Mart might still exist on um, the, uh, what's the street that leads into the Holland Tunnel? Uh, that's a, a place I ended up going, especially on my return trips to New York. I would go and get lunch in the Sunrise Mart down on um, whatever that street is called, but that's, that's a bit further downtown. But a lot of that uh, area, including Kim's video, which was uh, acquired by New York University, that whole area now has been transformed, transformed into student residences um, for the students who are mostly uptown on campuses or students of places like SVA, um, Parsons. These more designy kind of arty schools, I, w I would often do studio visits, um, especially when I came back later as a famous artist. <laughs> I would be invited to come in and talk to the students and look at the work they were doing. So that was always interesting. I, I liked doing that. Um, and uh, gosh, it, it's really just a very intense two year or just a year and a half period. And my apartment itself was kind of interesting. It was up, I bought new windows because it had these old wooden rotten windows and a fire escape in front, which would have made it very easy to break in and steal my studio equipment which was all very um, primitive. Um, it was just like a, a sampler and um, a laptop and stuff. But uh, so I, the windows that you can see now from the street on Street View, they are the windows I bought, the window frames that I bought. And even the air conditioner is probably the one I bought in Target, you know, and dragged back because it was too hot in the New York summer. Um, my apartment was probably the size of this apartment and it had a, a dump, a, a double level, so it had like a mezzanine bunk bed thing up a ladder, all made in, I think a painter had lived there before, so there was a lot of, um, the underside of the, the bed deck was all painted with sort of bohemian looking abstract uh, brush marks and things. And there was a little kitchen. I never had any cockroaches or anything. I did have a mouse problem though, and these cute little mice. I had to stick them onto glue traps and then I'd try to release them on the street afterwards, but they probably died of shock after being glue trapped. Um, and I had a little bathroom with a bath. Thank goodness, I can't survive without a bath. And um, I got these um, uh, umbrella, not umbrella chairs, what are they called, gull chairs? Gull, these fabric chairs, um, butterfly chairs, I think they're called, from Urban Outfitters, which was back in the day, that was quite a trendy shop. Um, Little did I know that actually, uh, if you look at people in the 60s, like this film of Nohara, the poet in the 60s, in a very similar loft apartment uh, in, I think in Soho, I'm not sure, or possibly the Greenwich Village, uh, where he's, uh, they've got the same kind of butterfly chairs and they've got the same kind of emptiness that I had in my place. I had a Noguchi lamp as well, or a fake Noguchi lamp. And... Um, I had Chinese furniture, which I'd found on the street. Chinese families had thrown out these drawers and very beautiful old wooden drawers with little funny stickers and things on them. So I'd inherit those and, and put things in the drawers. Um, and I'd uh, have stacks of art magazines and fashion magazines and things. Um, I remember also meeting um, someone who's still a good friend to this day, which is um, um, Misaki Kawaii. When she had just, she was, just off the boat, really, from Japan. She was selling little dolls on East Broadway uh, in Soho from a store, from a cart, you know, uh, trying to talk to people without being able to speak English and selling them these tiny little dolls. I don't know, it's, it's, a, whole, it's a whole world which I think has vanished. I'm told has vanished. Uh, it was already in the course of vanishing when I came back, but for the last time in 2009, I've been thinking about it because I was recently invited to go and play in the US for the first time just outside New York. And uh, I kind of shrugged a little bit and said I couldn't do it. Um, I don't really have any compulsion to go back there. And I think it would be, it would be much harder to get in, to get visas, to get in, to play and to make it profitable. I don't think it would work, especially not just for one show. So, um, for the time being, there's nothing planned and there's no returns planned. Uh, I, I, my, my world now involves uh, 
the Far East and Europe mostly, and Scotland occasionally. <laughs> That's about it. It has shrunk down a bit. Things are much less international. People are much less... Uh, there's a paranoia now at borders everywhere. It's very difficult. Post-Brexit and post, you know, post 9-11 is really when it started getting much more difficult. I had an O-1 visa at the time. Uh, I transitioned from a touring visa to an O-1 visa, which is the so-called genius visa. Uh, you need to prove that you're a culturally significant person, which I managed to do thanks to, you know, being interviewed by NPR and people like that. Um, so that was kind of nice. That was like a one yearly thing which you could renew. Uh, but I, after 9-11, I played a farewell concert in March 2002 and, um, at Joe's Cafe, actually, which is the Joseph Papp Public Theatre uh, near Union Square, and um, basically said farewell to New York and went off to Japan, which is a place I love and much prefer to be in. So, um, But... Maybe there wasn't that much difference. This is the thing I always come back to. There's not that much difference because the way I live in each different city tends to always sort of have the same rhythms and the same interests. And, you know, I'll go to... Here in Paris, I'll go to Yvonne Lambert or something to get the same fix I would have got from Printed Matter. Super important. I, I should have mentioned Printed Matter Arts uh, Bookshop, which initially I knew in its location in Soho, but then later it moved to... Um, Chelsea, and then I think also in uh, they had a, uh, an offshoot in PS1 in Queens. I didn't mention Queens either. I did often go up the Twin Towers because uh, there used to be this club on the top of the South Tower called Windows on the World, which was a place my friends who were in sort of Japanese bands uh, would play in Windows of the World. So you'd take the elevator up to the very top, and or during the day you'd go up there and just look at New York from the observation deck. Uh, so it was a real shock to... Uh, or I'd go to the mall in the basement. That's where I bought my little white television set, which I had on, on my bed deck in my flat. Um, it was kind of local. It was a local shopping centre, essentially, the World Trade Centre. So when it collapsed, it was shocking, to say the least. Um, and I entered into quite a strange psychological state after... Uh, you know, initially the smoke was blowing in a different direction, but in the middle of the night, that the, the night of 9-11, it uh, blew in directly into my window. The burning smell of, you know, buildings, humans, paper, um, jet fuel, all that stuff. It was a, a jet crash, a double jet crash in the centre of a city that you lived in and the smoke was blowing into your house and you didn't know if you'd suffocate with the smoke or not, so panicked and closed the windows and after that it was like what's next there was an anthrax thing actually somebody at that a hospital on 14th street that i used to go to to get my eye checked died of anthrax these uh, weird attacks which turned out to be from some veteran of the u.s army and not islamic terrorism at all uh, and then there were, you know there were just rumors about bubonic plague and ridiculous things like that there was there was going to be a next attack which never came on U.S. soil, but uh, the attacks were all the other way. The U.S. was attacking other people in revenge. So that was a horrible process, and I didn't really want to have anything to do with that country anymore after that happened. So it was the time to say farewell to New York, and uh, it's probably the time for me to say farewell to you in this video too. So I hope you've enjoyed it, and see you in the next one. Open University. <laughs>